Tales from Early English Chronicles, Part 1. The Adventures of King Horn. King Horn, in the version here given, is a fine old English story, evidently very popular with the common people. Earlier versions were probably familiar to the Norse in the 10th century, at which time Dublin was the capital of a Norse kingdom. Sudden was possibly the Isle of Man. There seems to be some historical basis for the story of Havelock, since the seal of the city of Grimsby today represents Grim with Havelock, or Havelock, on his right hand, and Goldborough on his left. The Fair Unknown is one of the King Arthur stories that is not included in Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort de Arthur. The Adventures of King Horn Retold by F. J. H. Darton Murray was king of Sudden in the West Country, a wise king whom all his subjects honored. Godhild was his queen, and no woman of that day was lovelier than she. Their son was named Horn, and when Horn was fifteen years old, the sun shone and the rain fell on no fairer boy. Twelve squires, each one the son of a man of noble birth, were chosen to be Horn's companions. Athulf was the best and truest of them, and dearest to Horn's heart, and one Fikenhild was the basest among them. It pleased King Murray, on a certain summer's day, to ride as was his wont by the seashore, with only two comrades. Suddenly as they rode they came upon a strange sight. There before them, on the edge of the waves, lay fifteen ships beached, full of fierce Saracens, and many other Saracens went busily to and fro upon the shore. "'What seek you here, pagan men?' cried Murray at that sight. "'What wares do you bring to this my land of sudden?' for he thought them to be merchants from a far land. "'We are come to slay all your folk who believe in Christ,' answered one of them, "'and that we will do right soon. "'As for you, you go not hence alive.' Thereat Murray was sorely troubled in heart. Nevertheless he made no sign of fear. He and his two companions, with bold mien, leapt down from their horses to fight more readily, and drew their swords and fell upon the pagans. Many a stout blow they dealt, many a Saracen felt the strength of their arms, but for all their might and valor they were but three against a host. From every side the enemy fell upon them unceasingly, and in a little time they lay their dead upon the sand. Then the Saracens left their ships and spread over the whole of sudden, slaying and burning and laying waste wherever they came. None might live, were he stranger or friend or native of the land, unless he forswore the Christian faith and became a pagan. Of all women in those days, God held the queen was saddest. Her kingdom was lost, her husband cruelly slain, and all her days were filled with grief. But worse befell her, for on a certain day the Saracens came suddenly, and took Horn prisoner and carried him away. God held escaped, and in her dire distress fled alone to a distant cave, and there lay hid, worshipping her god in secret, and praying that he would save her son from harm. Horn and his companions, for all his twelve squires had been captured with him, seemed in sorry case. The savage pagans were for killing all Christians, but their chief emir wished to have no innocent blood on his hands, and spoke out boldly. "'We might well slay you, Horn,' he said. "'You are young and fair and strong, and will grow yet stronger. Perchance if we spare you now, you will some day return and be avenged upon us, when you have come to your full power.' Yet we ourselves will not put you to death. The guilt shall not be on us, but on the sea. To the sea we will give you and your comrades. The sea shall be your judge, to save or drown as it will. Weeping and wringing their hands, Horn and his comrades were led down to the seashore. There a boat was made ready for them, with oars, but no rudder or sail. All their tears were vain. The Saracens forced them aboard, and turned the little craft adrift into the wide ocean. The boat drove fast and far through the water, and fear came down upon those in it. Soon they were tossing haphazard upon the rushing waves, now resting forlornly, now praying for help, now rowing wildly as if for their lives, if ever the violence of the sea abated for a moment. All that afternoon, and through the long dark night, they voyaged in cold and terror, till in the morning, as day dawned, Horn looked up and saw land at a little distance. Friends, said he, I have good tidings. Yonder I spy land, 
i hear the song of birds and see grass growing be merry once more our ship is coming to safety they took their oars and rowed lustily soon the keel touched the shore and they sprang out eagerly on to dry land leaving the boat empty the waves drew the little craft gently back to themselves and it began to glide away into the great sea go now from us dear boat cried horn lovingly to it as he saw it drawn away farewell sail softly and may no wave do you harm the boat floated slowly away and horn wept sorely at parting from it then they all turned their faces inland and left the sea behind them and set forth to seek whatsoever fortune might bring them end of section twenty three Tales from Early English Chronicles, Part 2 Horn is dubbed Knight Retold by F. J. H. Darton The country to which Horn and his comrades had come was called Westerness. Aylmer the Good was king of it, but of that the wonders knew not as yet. They journeyed far over hill and dale, ignorant of the way, and seeing no living man, until as the day drew to an end, there met them Aylmer the king himself. "'Whence do you come, friends?' asked he. "'Who are you that are so fair and straight of body?' Horn spoke up for them all, for he was wisest, and most skilled in the use of courteous words. "'We are from sudden, sire, of good lineage and Christian faith. "'The pagans came to our land, and slew my father and many others, and drove us from our homes. "'We thirteen whom you see were set adrift in a boat, to be the sport of the sea.' A day and a night have we travelled without sail or rudder, and our boat brought us to this land. We are in your hands, sire. Slay us, or keep us bound as prisoners. Do with us as you will. The good king was no ungentle boar. He spoke them fair and graciously. Tell me, child, he said, what is your name? No harm shall come to you at my hands, whosoever you be. Horn am I called, sire. Horn child, you are well and truly named. Your fame shall ring like a horn over dale and hill. Now, Horn, come with me. You and your comrades shall abide at my court. They set out for the king's palace. When they were come thither, Aylmer entrusted them to his steward, Athelbrus, whom he charged to bring them up in knightly ways. They were added to Aylmer's household, and taught all that squires of kings should know. But Horn was to come to greater things than this. He learnt quickly, and became beloved by every one, and most of all Rimenhild, the king's daughter, loved him from the day when she first set eyes on him. Her love for him grew daily stronger and stronger, though she dared speak no word of it to him, for she was a princess, and he only a squire rescued by chance from the sea. At length Rimenhild could hide her love no longer. She sent for Athelbrus the steward, and bade him bring Horn to her bower. But he, guessing her secret from her wild looks, was unwilling to send Horn to her, fearing the king's displeasure, and he bade Athel, Horn's dearest companion, go to the princess instead, hoping either that the princess would not know him from Horn, for she had as yet spoken to neither of them, and they were much alike in face and mien, or that by this plan she would see the folly of her desire. Athel came to Rimenhild's bower, and she did not know that he was not Horn, and received him lovingly. But soon the trick was made plain, for Athulf, as beseems a loyal heart, could not hear himself praised above all other squires in Aylmer's court, and vowed that Horn was far fairer and better than he. Then Rimenhild in a rage sent him from her, and bade Athelbrus bring Horn to her without more ado. And thus at last Horn came before the princess. King's daughter, said he with reverence and courtesy, Athelbrus the steward bade me come to you here. Say what you would have me do. Rimenhild rose, answering nothing till she had taken him by the hand, and made him sit by her, and embraced him lovingly. Welcome, Horn, she said. You are so fair that I cannot but love you. Take me to wife, have pity on my love. Horn knew not what to say. Princess, he began at last, I am too lowly for such a wife as you. I am but a thrall and a foundling, and owe all that I have to the king your sire. There is no meet wedding between a thrall and the king's daughter. At these words Rumenhild fell into a swoon, and Horn was filled with pity and love at the sight, 
and took her in his arms and kissed her. Dear lady, he said, be brave. Help me to win knighthood at the hands of the Lord my king. If I be dubbed knight, my thraldom is ended, and I am free to love you, as I do in my heart already. For Horn had long loved the princess secretly, but dared not hope that she would give him her love in turn. Rumenhild came to her senses as he spoke. Horn, she said, it shall be as you wish. Ere fourteen days have passed, you shall be made a knight. Thereupon she sent for Athelbrus again, and bade him pray the king Aylmer to dub Horn a knight, and to be brief, Horn was speedily knighted, and asking the king's leave, himself knighted in turn as twelve companions. As soon as he was knighted, Remenhild called him to her, and Athelf, his dear comrade, went with him into her presence. "'Sir Horn, my knight,' she said, "'sit by me here. See, it is time to fulfill your word. Take me for your wife.' Nay, Remenhild, answered Horn, that may not be yet. It is not enough that I am knighted. I must prove my knighthood, as all men do, in combat with some other knight. I must do a deed of prowess in the field for love of you. Then if I went through with my life, I will return and take you to wife. Be it so, Horn, now take from me this carven ring of gold. On it is wrought, be true to Remenhild. Wear it always on your finger, for my love's sake. The stone in it has such grace that never need you fear any wound, nor shrink from any combat, if you do but wear this ring, and look steadfastly upon it, and think of me. And you, Athelf, you too, when you have proven your knighthood, shall have such another ring also. Sir Horn, may heaven bless and keep you, and bring you safe to me again. With that Horn kissed her, and received her blessing, and went away to prove his knighthood in brave feats of arms. End of section 24《Tales from Early English Chronicles》Part 3 Horn the Knight Errant Retold by F. J. H. Darton When Horn had saddled his great black horse and put on his armor, he rode forth to adventure, singing gaily. Scarce had he gone a mile when he spied by the seashore a ship beached and filled with heathen saracens what do you bring hither asked horn whence do you come the pagans saw that he was but one man and they were many and answered boldly we are come to win this land and slay all its folk at that horn gripped his sword and his blood ran hot he sprang upon the saracen chief and smote him with all his strength so that he cleft the man's head from off his shoulders then he looked at the ring which Rumenhild had given him, and immediately such might came upon him that in a trice he slew full five score of the pagans. They fled in terror before him, and few of those whom he did not slay at the first onset escaped. Horn set the head of the Saracen leader on the point of his sword, and rode back to Aylmer's court. When he had come to the king's palace, he went into the great hall, where the king and all his knights sat. King Aylmer, he cried, and you as knights hear me. Today after I was dubbed knight, I rode forth and found a ship by the shore, filled with outlandish knaves, fierce Saracens, who were for slaying you all. I set upon them, my sword failed not, and I smote them to the ground. Lo, here is the head of their chief. Men marveled at Horn's prowess, and the king gave him words of praise. But not yet did Horn dare speak of his love for Rimenhild. On the morrow at dawn, King Aylmer went a-hunting in the forest, and Horn's twelve companions rode with him. But Horn himself did not go to the chase. He sought instead to tell his lady Rimenhild of his deeds, and went to her bower secretly, thinking to hear her joy in the feats he had done. But he found her weeping bitterly. "'Dear love,' he said, "'why do you weep?' Alas, Horn, I have had an evil dream, she answered. I dreamed that I went fishing, and saw my net burst. A great fish was taken in it, and I thought to have drawn him out safely, but he broke from my hands, and rent the meshes of the net. It is in my mind that this dream is of ill omen for us, Horn, and that the great fish signifies you yourself, whereby I know that I am to lose you. Heaven keep this ill hap from us, dear princess, said Horn. Not shall harm you, I vow, 
I take you for my own forever, and plight my troth to you here and now. But though he seemed to be of good cheer, he too was stirred by this strange dream, and had evil forebodings. Meanwhile, Feigenhild, riding with King Aylmer by the river Stour, was filled with envy of Horn's great deeds against the Saracens, and at last he said to the king, King Aylmer, hear me. This Horn, whom you knighted yesterday for his valor in slaying the Saracens, would fain undo you. I have heard him plotting to kill you and take Rumenhold to wife. Even now, as we ride here by the river, he is in her bower. He, Horn, the foundling, is with your daughter, the Princess Rumenhold. Go now and take him, and drive him out of your land for his presumption. For Feigenhild had set a watch on Horn, and found out the secret of his love for Rumenhild. Thereupon King Aylmer turned his horse, and rode home again, and found Horn with Rumenhild, even as Feigenhild had said. "'Get you hence, Horn!' he cried in anger. "'You base foundling, forth out of my daughter's bower. Away with you altogether. See that you leave this land of Westerness right speedily. Here is no place nor work for you. If you flee not soon, your life is forfeit.' Horn flushed with rage, went to the stable, and set saddle on his steed and took his arms, so fierce was his mien that none dared to withstand him. When all was ready for his going, he sought out Rimenhild. "'Your dream was true, dear love,' he said. "'The fish has torn your net, and I go from you. But I will put a new ending to the dream. Fear not. Now fare you well. The king your father has cast me out of his realm, and I must needs seek adventure in other lands. Seven years will I wonder, and it may be I shall win such fortune.' I shall bring me back to sue honorably for you. But if at the end of seven years I have not come again to Westerness, nor sent word to you, then do you, if you so will, take another man for husband in my stead, and put me out of your heart. Now for the last time hold me in your arms and kiss me good-bye. So Horn took his leave. But before he went away from Aylmer's court, he charged Athelf, his friend, to watch over Rimenhild, and guard her from harm. Then he set forth on his horse, and rode down to the sea, and took ship to sail away alone from Westerness. End of section 25and the ship drove blindly before it for many leagues, till at length it was cast up on land. Horn stepped out onto the beach, and there before him saw two princes, whose names, for they greeted him kindly, were Harald and Berold. "'Whence are you?' they asked, when they had told him who they were. "'What are you called?' Horn thought it wise to hide his real name from them, lest it should come to Aylmer's ears." and his anger reach horn, even in this distant land. "'I am called Cuthbert,' he answered, "'and I am come far from the west in this little ship, "'seeking adventure and honour. "'Well met, Sir Knight,' said Harald. "'Come now to our father the king. "'You shall do knightly deeds in his service.' "'They led him to King Thurston, their father, "'and when Thurston saw that Horn was a man of might, "'skilled in arms, and a true knight, "'he took him into his service readily.' So Horn, or Cuthbert, as they knew him, abode at Thurston's court, and served the king in battle. But no great and notable thing befell him until the coming of Christmas. It was King Thurston's custom to make each Christmas a great feast, lasting many days. To this feast Horn was bidden, and all the other knights of the court. Great mirth and joy was there that yuletide. All men feasted with light hearts. Suddenly about noonday, the great doors of the king's hall were flung open, and a monstrous giant strode in. He was fully armed, in pagan raiment, and his mien was proud and terrible. "'Sit still, Sir King,' he roared, as Thurston turned to him. "'Hearken to my tidings. I am come hither with a Saracen host, and my comrades are close at hand. From them I bring a challenge, and this is the challenge.' One of us alone will fight any three of your knights in a certain place. If your three slay our one, then we will depart and leave you and your land unscathed. But if our one champion slays your three, 
then will we take your land for our own and deal with it and you as it pleases us to-morrow at dawn we will make ready for the combat and if you take not up this challenge and send your appointed knights to battle then we will burn and lay waste and slay all over this realm thereupon he turned and stalked out of the hall saying never another word this is a sorry hap said king thurston when the saracen had gone and left them all aghast yet must we take up the challenge cuthbert he said turning to horn you have heard this pagan boast will you be one of our three champions harold and Birold, my sons shall be the other two and may god prosper all three but alas it is of little avail we are all dead men but horn felt no fear he started up from the board when he heard the king's sorrowful words sir king he cried this is all amiss it is not to our honour that three christian knights should fight this one pagan i alone will lay the giant low with my own sword unaided thurston hoped little of this plan but none the less he agreed to it and when the next day came he arose betimes and with his own hands helped to arm horn and having made ready he rode down to the field of battle with him there in a great open space stood the saracen giant awaiting them his friends standing by him to abide the issue of the combat they made little tarrying but fell to right soon horn dealt mightily with the giant he attacked him at once and showered blows upon him so the pagan was hard pressed and begged for a breathing space let us rest a while sir knight he said never suffered i such blows from any man's hand yet except from king murray whom i slay in sudden at that dear name horn's blood ran hot within him before him he saw the man who had slain his father and had driven himself from his kingdom he fell to more furiously than ever and drove hard at the giant beneath the shield and as he smote he cast his eye upon the ring rimmenhild had given him therewith his strength was redoubled so straight and strong was the blow so true his arm that he pierced the giant to the heart and he fell dead upon the ground when they saw their champion slain the saracens were stricken with panic they turned and fled headlong to their ships thurston and his knights pursuing a great battle was fought by the ships harold and Birold were slain but horn did such deeds of prowess that every pagan was killed there was great lamentation over the two princes their bodies were brought to the king's palace and laid in state and lastly buried in a great church built for them end of section twenty six tales from early english chronicles part five horn's return retold by f j h darton there was now no heir to thurston's kingdom since harold and Birold were slain and in a little time when the king's grief abated he bethought him of what should befall his people when his time came to die. Cuthbert, he said to Horn one day, when he had pondered long over these things, there is no heir to my kingdom. There is but my daughter Reynold to come after me. Will you wed her and be king, and rule this land after my death? Horn was sorely tempted, but he looked on his ring and remembered Remenhild. Sir King, he answered, you do me great honor, and I give you thanks. I am under a vow, and cannot wed the Lady Reynold. He would say no more, but was firm in his purpose, and King Thurston had to be content with his loyal service only. For seven years Horn abode at Thurston's court, serving in arms under him and winning great fame by his knightly deeds. No word did he send to Rimenhild, nor receive tidings of any kind from Westerness. About the end of the seventh year, Horn chanced to be riding in the forest, when he met a page, journeying as if towards Thurston's palace. "'What do you here?' he said. "'Whither do you go?' "'Sir,' answered the page, "'I have a message from one Sir Horn, from Sir Athelf in Westerness, where Elmer is king. The Lady Rimenhild is to be wedded on Sunday to King Modi of Rains, and I am sent to bring tidings thereof to Sir Horn. But I can find him nowhere, nor hear even so much as his name.' though I have wandered far and wide. At this heavy news Horn hid his name no longer. 
he told the page who he was, and bade him go back with all speed, and say to Rimenhild that she need no longer mourn. Her lover would save her ere Sunday came. The page returned blithely with this message. But he never delivered it, for as he went back he was by chance drowned, and Rimenhild, hearing no word of horn, despaired. Athel, too, watching long for Horn each day on the tower of Aylmer's palace, gave up hope. But Horn was not idle or forgetful. When he had dispatched the page, as he thought, safely back to Athel and Rimenhild, he went straight to King Thurston, and without more pretense told him his true name and all the story of the adventures. Sire, he said at the end, I have served you well. Grant me reward for my service, and help me to win Rimenhild. See, you offered me the hand of your daughter Reynold, that I might not accept, for I was pledged already, but perchance my comrade Athelf might be deemed an honorable suitor. If you will but help me, Athelf shall be Reynold's husband. That I vow. Sire, give me your aid. Be it so, said Thurston, loath to lose horn, but glad to hear of a knight waiting to wed the lady Reynold. Straightway a levy of knights was made, and Horn set forth in the ship with a brave body of fighting men. The wind blew favorably, and ere long they came to Westerness. Even as they touched the shore, the bell ceased ringing for the marriage of Rimenhild to King Modi. Horn saw how late they had arrived, and that he must needs act warily, if he would save Rimenhild in the midst of the rejoicings over her wedding. He left his men on board ship and landed alone, setting out to walk to the palace, where the wedding feast was about to be held. As he walked thus he met a palmer clad in pilgrim's weeds. "'Whither go you, Sir Palmer?' he asked. "'I have just come from a wedding,' he answered, "'from the wedding of Rimenhild, the king's daughter, "'and sad and sorrowful she seemed to be, in truth, on this wedding day. "'Now heaven help me, Palmer, but I will change clothes with you.' Take you my robe, and give me your long cloak. Today I will drink at that wedding feast, and some shall rue the hour that I sit at the board with them. Without more ado he changed clothes with the palmer, taking also his staff and scrip, and staining his face till it was like that of a toil-worn traveller. Then he set out for the palace once more. He came soon to the gates, where a porter strove to bar his entrance. But Horn broke in the wicket gate and threw the man over the drawbridge, so that his ribs were broken. None other stood in Horn's way, and he went into the great hall, and took his place in the lowly seat among the beggars and poor men. As he looked about him he saw at a little distance Rimenhild, weeping and lamenting sorely. Athelf he did not see, for he was still keeping watch in the tower for Horn's return. Before long Rimenhild rose from her seat, and began to minister to the guests, according to custom, pouring them out wine and ale and horn beakers. When she came low down among the guests, Horn spoke to her. Fair queen, he said, serve us also. We beggars are athirst. She laid down the vessel she bore, and took a great gallon cup, and filled it with brown ale, and offered it to him, thinking him a glutton. Take this cup, she said, and drink your fill. Never saw I so forward a beggar. I will not drink your ale, lady, answered Horn, for he was minded to let her know who he was, and yet to hide himself from all others at the feast. Give me wine, I am no beggar. I am a fisherman, come hither to search my nets, and see what I have caught. Pledge me now yourself, and drink to Horn of Horn. Thus by his strange words he thought to recall to her that dream she had formerly dreamed of a great fish that escaped from her net. Rimenhild looked on him, and hope and fear sprang up in her heart together. She knew not what his saying about the nets and horn of horn might mean. With a steadfast look she took her drinking horn, and filled it with wine and gave it to horn. Drink your fill, friend, she said, and tell me if you have seen aught of this horn of whom you seem to speak. Horn drained the beaker, and as he put it down, dropped into it the ring that Rimenhild had given him so long ago. When Rimenhild saw the ring, she knew it at once. She made an excuse, and left the feast, and went to her bower. In a little time she sent for the palmer secretly, and asked him where he got the ring. 
Queen, said Horn, in my travels I met one named Horn. He gave me this ring to bring to you. It was on shipboard I met him, and he lay dying. He said this to prove if her love were still constant to him. But Rimenhild believed him, and when she heard him say that Horn was dead, became as one mad with grief. Then Horn, seeing how strong was her love, threw off his palmer's cloak, and showed her the false stain on his face, and told her that he was in very truth Horn, her lover. When their first joy at meeting again was over, Horn told the princess of the men he had brought with him in his ship. Secretly they sent for Athelf, and when he too had learnt all Horn's tidings, a message was sent to the men in the ship, who came to the palace speedily, and were admitted by a private door. Then all the company of them broke suddenly into the banquet hall, and fell upon those there, and slew many, but Modi and Feichenheld escaped, and fled from Westerness. End of section 27《Tales from Early English Chronicles》Part 6 The King of Sudden Retold by F. J. H. Darton When they had made an end of slaying, Horn revealed himself to Aylmer, and reproached him for giving his daughter in marriage to Modi, whom she did not love, and Aylmer, when he heard of Horn's deeds, for the fame which Horn had won under the name of Cuthbert had gone into many lands, could not but feel sorrow that he had sent Horn away in anger seven years ago and he begged Horn to stay at his court and wed Rumenhild, for the marriage with Modi was not fully complete when Horn and his men broke up the feast. "'Nay, I am of royal blood,' answered Horn. "'You thought me a foundling and despised me. "'For that insult you formally put upon me. "'I vow I will not take Rumenhild for my wife "'until I have won my kingdom of Sudden back from the Saracens "'and avenge my father King Murray, whom they slew. "'I am a king's son,' and I will be a king before my wife shall come to me. Aylmer could not gainsay Horn in his purpose, and once more Horn set out on his wanderings. With him went Sir Athelf and a band of brave knights. They took ship and for five days sailed on the seas with a favoring wind, till at last, late at night on the fifth day, they came to the shores of Sudden. Horn and Athelf landed to spy out the country. A little way inland they came upon an old knight sleeping by the wayside. On his shield was the device of a cross. Horn woke him gently. "'Tell me, Sir Knight, who are you?' he asked. "'Your shield shows that you are a Christian, but this land is ruled by pagans.' "'I am a Christian, truly,' said the old knight. "'But I serve the pagans perforce. They hold the power, and I must needs fight for them against my will. "'This land is in a sorry case.' If King Murray's son, Horn, were here, perchance we might drive the pagans out. But I know not where to find him, nor where my own son is, for Athel of my son was Horn's dearest companion. Such changes had the long absence wrought in Horn and Athel, and the old knight, that they did not recognize one another. But these words Horn and Athel knew for certain, that they were indeed in sudden. They told the old knight who they were, and learnt that Horn's mother, the Queen Godhild, was still alive, and many knights in the land besides, desirous of driving the Saracens out, but unable to fulfill their desire through lack of a leader and of men. Horn forthwith summoned his men from the ships, and blew his trumpet for battle, and attacked the Saracens. It was a great fight, but before long the heathen were defeated, and those who were not slain were driven altogether out of the land. Thus Horn came into his kingdom again, but he had yet to punish Feichenhild the traitor, who first separated him from Rimenhild, for this Aylmer had told him, and King Modi, who had sought to wed her against her will. Feichenhild, when Horn came back to Westerness in time to save Rimenhild from Modi, had fled, but he still plotted deep treachery in his heart. By bribes and favors he won many knights to follow him, and he built himself a great castle of stone, set on a rock, surrounded on all sides with water, so that none might come at it easily. Then by stealth one night he carried off Rimenhild, and married her in this castle, holding a great feast at sunrise to celebrate the marriage. Horn knew not of this by word of mouth or letter, but in a dream he beheld Rimenhild. 
she seemed to him as though shipwrecked calling upon his name but when she tried to swim to him feigenheld appeared and prevented her when he awoke horn told athel this vision and when they had thought upon the lore of dreams they agreed that it meant that rimenheld was in feigenheld's seagirt castle the fame of which was known to all men straightway they took a ship and sailed to the land hard by where the castle lay there a certain knight named arnoldin cousin of athel met them and told them that feigenheld had just wedded rimenheld and the wedding feast was now beginning they could not come nigh the castle openly as enemies for none would approach it across the water unless those within were willing to let him enter but horn and some of his knights disguised themselves as harpers hiding their swords under long cloaks they took a boat and rowed under the walls of the banqueting hall and there they played and sang merrily till feigenhold heard them and called them into the feast when they had come into the hall they began to sing again at feigenhold's bidding but soon horn looked once more upon his ring and then with a shout he and his companions fell upon feigenhild and his men and slew every one of them the tale is soon told horn made arnold and king in feigenhild's castle athulf he sent to thurston's court where in a little time he married the princess reynold and horn went back to his kingdom of sudden and there made rimenhild his queen long and happily they reigned in true love and in fear of God. End of section 28《Tales from Early English Chronicles》Part 7 Havelock Hid from the Traitor Retold by F. J. H. Darton In former days there was a king of England called Athelwold, the very flower of England was he, and he ruled justly and well. All things in his realm he ordered strictly, and maintained truth and right throughout the land. Under his rule robbers and traitors were put down, men bought and sold freely, without fear, and wrongdoers were so hard-pressed that they could but lurk and creep in secret corners. Athelwold set up justice in his kingdom. There was mercy for the fatherless in his day, his judgments could not be turned aside by bribes of silver and gold. If any man did evil, the king's arm reached him to punish him, were he ever so wary and strong. This Athelwold had no heir, save only one daughter, very fair to look upon, named Goldborough. But ere she grew up, the king fell ill of a dire sickness. He knew well that his time was come, and that death was nigh him. "'What shall I do now?' he said in his heart. How shall my daughter fare when I am dead? My heart is troubled for her. I think not of myself. She cannot yet speak or walk. If she were of age to ride, she could rule England, and I would care nothing about dying. But it was idle to lament. The king was sure in his mind that he must die, and he sent messengers to all his vassals, to his earls and his barons, rich and poor, from Roxburgh to Dover, bidding them come to him speedily where he lay sick. All those who heard his message were sad at the tidings, and prayed that he might be delivered from death. They came with all speed to the king at Winchester. Welcome, said he, when they entered the hall of his dwelling. Full glad am I that you are come. You see in what sorry case I lie. I have bidden you here that you may know that my daughter shall be your lady when I, your lord, am dead. But she is yet a child, and I am fain to make some true man her guardian till she be a woman grown. And I will make Godridge, Earl of Cornwall, do guard her and bring her up. He is a true man, wise in counsel and wise in deed, and men have him in awe. They brought a holy book to the king. On it he made Earl Godridge swear a solemn oath to keep Goldborough well and truly, till she was of age to rule and to order the realm of England wisely. Then the little maid was given to the earl, her new guardian. Athelwold thanked the earl, and bade him to be true to his charge, and in a little while death took the good king. When King Athelwold was dead, Godrich ruled England. In every castle he set some knight of his own whom he could trust. All the English folk he caused to take an oath to be faithful to him, and in a little while Athelwold's realm was altogether in his power. In the meantime Goldborough was kept at Winchester, and brought up as befitted a king's daughter. 
Every day she seemed to grow in wisdom and fairness, till when she was twenty years old there was none like her in the land. But Godrich, when he saw how good and how fair she was, grew jealous of her. Shall she be queen over me, he thought. Must I give up my kingdom and my power to her? She has waxed all too proud. I have treated her with too great gentleness. She shall not be queen. I will rule, and after me my son shall be king. As that treason crept into his mind, he forgot his oath to Athelwold, caring not a straw for it. Without more ado, he sent for Goldborough from Winchester and took her to Dover. There he set her in a strong castle and clad her meanly, and guarded her so strictly that no man could see her come to her without his leave. Now it chanced that about this time the same thing came to pass in Denmark as in England. Berkabane, king of Denmark, died, and at his death he gave to one Earl Goddard the charge of his kingdom, and of his son Havelock and his two daughters, Swanborough and Elfled. Goddard stood by his oath no better than Godrich, but cast all three children into prison, and well nigh starved them to death. But when they had lain in prison for a little time, and were nearly dead of hunger, he went to see them. "'How do you fare?' he asked, for Havelock ran to him and crept upon his knees when he sat down, and looked up joyfully into his face. "'I hear that you moan and cry. Why is this?' "'We hunger sore,' answered Havelock. "'We have not to eat, and no man has brought us meat or drink. We are nigh dead of hunger.' Goddard heard his words, but felt no pity. He cared not a straw for their misery. He took Swanborough and Elfled by the hand, and slew them then and there. Then he turned to Havelock, and would have slain him also. But the boy in terror cried for mercy. "'Have pity,' he said. "'Spare me, and I will give you all Denmark, and will vow never to take up arms against you. Let me live, and I will flee from Denmark this very day, and never more come back.' I will take oath that Berkabane was not my father. At that some touch of doubt came into Goddard's mind. He put up his knife and looked at Havelock. If I let him go alive, he thought, he might work me much woe. He shall die, but not now. I will cast him in the sea and drown him. He went thence and sent for a fisherman named Grim. Grim, he said, you are my thrall. Do my will, and tomorrow I will give you your freedom. Take the boy Havelock at night to the sea, and cast him therein. Grim took the boy and bound him with strong cords, and bore him back to his cottage, and showed him to his wife Levy. You see this boy, wife, said he. I am to drown him in the sea. When I have done it, I shall be made a free man, and much gold will be ours, so as our Lord Goddard promised. When Dame Levy heard that, she started up, and threw Havelock down so roughly that he hurt his head on a great stone that lay on the ground. Alas, that I was ever a king's son, he moaned in his pain, and he lay there where he fell till night time. When night fell, Grim made ready for his task. Rise up, wife, blow the fire, said he. Light a candle. I must keep my word to my lord. Levy rose to tend the fire. Her eyes fell on Havelock, who still lay on the ground. Round him she marveled to see, shone a bright light, and out of his mouth proceeded light as it were a sunbeam. "'What is that light?' quoth Dame Levy. "'Grim, look what it means. What is this light?' Grim went to Havelock and unbound him. He rolled back his shirt from the boy's shoulder. There he saw bright and clear a king's birthmark. "'Heaven help us,' said Grim. "'This is the heir to Denmark, who should be king and lord of us all. "'He will work Goddard great harm.' "'Then he fell on his knees before Havelock. "'Lord King,' he said, "'have mercy on me and on Levy here. "'We are both yours, Lord, both your servants. "'We will keep you and nurture you till you can ride and bear shield and spear. "'Goddard shall know naught of it. "'Some day I will take my freedom at your hands, not at his.' Then was Havelock blithe and glad. He sat up and asked for bread. I am well nigh dead, he said, with hunger and hardship. They fed him and cared for him, and lastly put him to bed, and he slept soundly. On the morrow Grim went to the trader Goddard. 
I have done your will on the boy, Lord, he said. He is drowned in the sea. Now I pray you give me gold for a reward, and grant me my freedom as you vowed. Goddard looked at him, fierce and cruel of mien. Will you rather not be made an earl, proud knave? he asked. Go home, fool, go, and be ever more a thrall and churl as you have ever been. No other reward shall be yours. For very little I would lead you to the gallows for your wicked deed. Grim went away. What shall I do, he thought as he hurried home? He will assuredly hang me on the gallows tree. It were better to flee out of the land altogether. He came home and told Levy all, and they took counsel together. Soon Grim sold all his possessions. Only his boat he kept, and that he made ready for a voyage, till there was not so much as a nail wanting to make it better. Then he took on board his wife and his three sons, Robert the Red, William Wendet, and Hugh Raven, and his two fair daughters, Gunnild and Levive, and Havelock, and they set sail. The wind blew fair behind them, and drove them out to sea. Long did they sail, and came at last to England, to Lindsay at the mouth of the Humber. They landed safely, and before long Grim began to make a little house of clay and turf for them to dwell in. He named the place after himself, Grimsby, and so men call it now, and shall call it forever, from now even to doomsday. End of section 29《From Early English Chronicles》Part 8 Havelock Married Against His Will Retold by F. J. H. Darton Grim was a skillful fisherman, and caught many good fish. Great baskets did he make, and others his sons made, and they carried the fish inland in these baskets and sold them. All over the country did Grim go with his fish, and came home always with store of bread or corn or beans against their need. Much he sold in the fair town of Lincoln, and counted many a coin after his sales there. Thus Grim fared for many winters, and Havelock worked with the rest, thinking it no shame to toil like any thrall, though he was a king's son born. There came at last a year of great dearth. Corn was so scarce that all men were in poverty, and Grim did not know how to feed all his family. For Havelock he had great dread, for he was strong and lusty, and would eat more than he could earn. And soon the fish in the sea also began to fail them, so that they were in sore straits. But Grim cared more for Havelock than for all his own family. All his thoughts ran on Havelock. Dear son Havelock, he said at last, we shall die of hunger, Annan. All our food is gone. It is better for you to go hence, and strive for yourself only, and not try to help us here. You are stout and strong, Go to Lincoln. There is many a man of substance there, who might take you in service. It were better for you to serve there than to see us starve here and to starve along with us. Would that I could clothe you fitly. Alas, I am too poor. Yet for your sake I will cut up the sail of my boat, and make you a cloak of it to cover your rags. He took the sail from his boat, and cut it up rudely into a cloak for Havelock. Then Havelock bade him Godspeed and set out, and came in time to the city of Lincoln. He had no friend in Lincoln, and knew no man. For two days he went to and fro, fasting. No man had work or food for him. But on the third day he heard a cry, Porters, porters, hither quickly. He sprang forward like a spark from coal, and thrust aside all who stood in his path. Sixteen stout lads did he knock down, and came to where fish was being laden into carts for Earl Godrich of Cornwall. There stood the Earl's cook, calling for men to load the carts, and Havelock fell to work with a will at his bidding. When all was done, "'Will you take service with me?' said the cook to Havelock. "'I will pay you good hire and feed you well.' "'Give me enough to eat, good sir,' answered Havelock, "'and I care not what you pay me. "'I will blow your fire and fetch wood and water.' I can wash dishes, and cleave faggots, and clean eels, and do all that you need. You shall be my man, answered the cook. So Havelock took service in Earl Godrich's household, and drew water and cut wood. Strong and large was he of body, and fair to look on. Earl Godrich was lord of all England. It lay as it were in his hand. 
many men were wont to come to him at lincoln to talk of great things and they held a parliament there and came thither with a great train of men-at-arms and followers so that the town was always full of folk coming and going it chanced one day that eight or ten young men began to play together near where havelock was at work and they fell to throwing a great stone huge and heavy he must needs be a stout man who could so much as lift it to his knee but those who threw it now were champions and could cast it many a foot havelock looked on and longed to throw against them and his master seeing his looks bade him go and try what he could do he took the stone and poised it well and at the first effort he threw it twelve feet or more farther than any other man we have been here too long said the rest this lad is mightier than any of us it is time for us to go hence they went away and spread the news that there was at Lincoln a lad mightier than any man of that day, and Havelock's fame grew and was known far and wide. It came at last to Earl Godrich's ears. This is a stout knave, thought the Earl, when he heard of Havelock's strength. I would that he were wedded to Goldborough. He is the fairest and strongest man in England, and if I gave Goldborough to him, I should keep my word to Athelwold in some sort for there is none like Havelock. No better man could she desire. And if she were wedded to him, she would be out of my way, and I should be secure in my rule, and my son should reign in England after me. Thus he thought and planned secretly. Annan he sent for Goldborough, and brought her to Lincoln. At her coming he caused bells to be rung, and there was great rejoicing, but he was nevertheless full of craft. "'You shall have the fairest man alive for husband,' he said to Goldborough. "'Therefore have I sent for you. "'How would no man but a king or king's son be ever so fair?' she answered boldly. "'Would you gainsay me as if you were queen and lady over me?' cried Godrich in great wrath. "'You shall have a churl for husband, and no other. "'My cook's knave shall wed you. He shall be your lord. "'Tomorrow shall you be wedded to him.' Goldborough wept and prayed for mercy, but it was of no avail. On the morrow the church bell was rung, and Godrich sent for Havelock. "'Master, are you minded to marry?' he asked. "'Nay, by my life,' quoth Havelock. "'What should I do with a wife? "'I cannot feed her or clothe her. "'I have no house and no possessions. "'The very clothes I wear are the cook's, and I am his servant.' "'If you do not take to wife her whom I will give you,' said Godrich, I will hang you high aloft, or thrust out your eyes. At that Havelock was sore afraid, and granted all that Godrich bade. Then Godrich sent for Goldborough. You will take this man for husband, he said, or you go to the gallows, unless rather I burn you at the stake. She was afraid at his threats, and dared not refuse, though she liked it ill. So they two were wedded perforce, and neither took joy in it. End of section 30
and as she looked an angel's voice spoke to her goldboro let your sorrow be havelock your husband is a king's son and a king's heir the golden cross signifies that he shall possess all denmark and england and shall be king of both realms when she heard the angel's voice goldboro could not contain her joy but turned and kissed havelock as he slept Havelock had not heard the angel, but he started out of his sleep at Goldborough's kiss. "'Dear lady, are you awake?' he said. "'A strange dream have I just dreamed. I thought I was in Denmark, on the highest hill that ever I came to. It was so high that I could see, it seemed, all the world spread out. As I sat there I began to possess Denmark, with all its towns and strong castles, and my arms were so long that I surrounded in one grasp all Denmark.' and drew it towards me till every man therein cleaved to me. Another dream I dreamed also, that I flew over the salt sea to England, and with me went all the folk of Denmark. When I came to England, I took it all into my hand, and Goldborough I gave it to you. Dear wife, what may this be? May these dreams turn to joy, Havelock, as I deem they will, answered Goldborough. I say to you that you shall wear the crown of England in time to come, and Denmark shall kneel at your feet. Within a year this shall come to pass. Let us two go to Denmark speedily, and do you pray, Grimm's sons, that they go with you all three. On the morrow Havelock went to church and besought aid of God. Then he betook himself to Grimm's three sons, Robert and William and Hugh. Listen now to me, he said, and I will tell you a thing concerning myself. My father was king of the Danish land, and I should have been his heir, but a wicked man seized the kingdom when my father died, and slew my two sisters, and gave me to Grimm to drown, but Grimm spared me and brought me hither, as you know. Now I am come to an age where I can wield weapons and deal stout blows, and never will I take comfort till I see Denmark again. I pray you come thither with me. I will reward you well, and will give each of you ten castles, with the lands and towns and woods that belong thereto. "'We will follow you whithersoever you bid us, Havelock,' they answered, "'and we will, if it please God, win back your kingdom for you.' Havelock gave them due thanks, and began straightway to prepare all things for his going to Denmark. Soon he had made ready, and they set sail. Their voyage prospered, and they landed safely in Denmark, in the dominions of one Ubi, a rich earl, who had been a friend of King Birkabane, Havelock's father. When Havelock heard who was lord of that part of Denmark, he was glad, and set out to go to Ubi's castle in good hope. He dared not yet to say that he was Birkabane's son, for if Earl Goddard heard of it, he would come against him and slay him before he could win any followers. But he went to Ubi, and spoke him fair and courteously, and gave him a gold ring, and asked leave to settle in that land to be a merchant. And Ubi, seeing how strong and comely Havelock was, gladly gave him leave, and thereafter bade him to a great feast. Havelock went to the feast, and Goldborough with him, and Grimm's sons also, and Ubi grew to love him so well that when the feast was ended, he sent him with ten knights and sixty men-at-arms to the magistrate of those parts, Bernard Brunn, a man of might and substance. Bernard was a trusty man, and entertained Havelock and Goldborough and all their company well. But as they sat at meat, there came tidings that a band of sixty thieves, all armed and fierce, was at the gate, demanding entrance. At that news Bernard started up and took a good axe in his hand, and went to the gate, and Havelock followed him. "'What do you hear, rascals?' cried Bernard. "'If I open the door to you, some of you will rue it.' "'What say you?' answered one of the thieves. "'Think you that we are afraid of you. We shall enter by this gate for all that you can do.' Thereupon he seized a great boulder, and cast it mightily against the gate, and broke in. Havelock saw what befell, and went to the gate. He drew therefrom the great crossbar, and threw the gate wide open. "'I abide here,' he cried. "'Flee, you dogs!' "'Nay,' quoth one, "'you shall pay for waiting.' And he came running at Havelock, and the two others close behind with him. But Havelock lifted up the door-beam, and at one blow slew all three. Then he turned upon the others, and in a moment overthrew four more. But a host of them beset him with swords, 
and all his skill could not prevent them from wounding him. Full twenty wounds had he from crown to toe. But he began so to mow with a beam that the robbers soon felt how hard he could smite. There was none who could escape him, and in a little while he had felled twenty of them. Then a great din began to arise, for the rest of the thieves set upon Havelock and Bernard with all their might. But Hugh and his brothers heard the noise, and came running with many other men, and before long there was not one of the thieves left alive. On the morrow tidings came to Ubi that Havelock had slain with a club more than a score of stout rogues. He went down to Bernard and asked him what had come to pass, and Bernard, sore wounded from the fight, showed him his wounds and told him how sixty robbers had attacked his house, and how Havelock had slain great plenty of them. But Havelock also, he said, was grievously wounded. Others also of Bernard's men told the like true tale, and Ubi sent for Havelock, and when he had seen his wounds, called for a skillful leech, and took Havelock into his house and cared for him. The first night that Havelock lay in Ubi's house, Ubi slept nigh him in a great chamber, with places boarded off for each man. About midnight he awoke, and saw a great light in the place where Havelock lay, as bright as if it were day. What may this be, he thought? I will go myself and see. Perchance Havelock secretly holds revel with his friends, and has lit many lights. I vow he shall do no such sottishness in my castle. He stood up and peeped in between the boards that shut Havelock from him. He saw him sleeping fast, as still as any stone, and he was aware of a great light coming as it were from Havelock's mouth. He was aghast at that sight, and called secretly to his knights and sergeants and men-at-arms, and more than five score of them, and bade them come and see the strange light. And the light continued to issue from Havelock's mouth, and to grow in strength till it was as bright as two hundred wax candles. Havelock's right shoulder was towards Ubi and his men. Suddenly, as they looked at the light, they saw the king's mark on the shoulder, a bright cross, brighter than gold, sparkling like a carbuncle stone. The newbie knew that Havelock was a king's son, and he guessed that he must be Birkabane's son, the rightful king. When Havelock awoke, he fell at his feet and did obeisance, he and all his men. Dear Lord, he said, I know you to be Birkabane's son. You shall be king of Denmark. Right soon shall every lord and baron come and do you homage. Then was Havelock glad and blithe, and gave thanks to God for his goodness. Before long Ubi dubbed Havelock knight, and as soon as he was knighted, all the barons and lords of those parts came to him and swore fealty, and Annan they crowned him king of Denmark, and set themselves in array to attack the false Earl Goddard. But Goddard's knights, being weary of his rule, had all gone over to Havelock, and Grim's son Robert sufficed to meet him in combat. Robert wounded him in the right arm, and they bound him and brought him before Havelock. Sorry now was Goddard's lot. All his greatness was gone from him. He came before Havelock and his nobles, and they gave sentence upon him that he should be flayed alive and then hanged. And so he came to his end, in great misery and torment. When Godrich in England heard that Havelock was king of all Denmark, and proposed, for Havelock had given out that this was his intent, to come to England and set Goldborough on her throne, he set to work to gather a great host to meet Havelock when he should come, and he spread lying tales to make the English hate and fear Havelock, saying that he would burn and destroy and oppress them, and by these means he got together many and led them to Grimsby. Hannon came Havelock and his men, and landed at Grimsby, and they fought a great battle. All that day Havelock's men fought with Godrich's men, and on the morrow they fought again, and Godrich came face to face with Havelock himself. Godrich, Havelock cried, you have taken Athelwold's kingdom for yourself. I claim it for his daughter Goldborough. Yield it up, and I will forgive you, for you are a doughty knight. Never will I yield, answered Godrich. I will slay you here. He gripped his sword, and smote at Havelock, and clove his shield in twain. But Havelock drew his own good sword, and with one blow felled him to the earth. Yet Godrich started up again, 
and dealt him such a stroke on the shoulder that his armor was broken, and the blade bit into the flesh. Then Havelock heaved up his sword in turn, and struck fiercely, and shore off Godridge's hand so that he could smite no more, but yielded as best he might. They seized Godrich and fettered him, and all the English took the oath of fealty to Goldborough, and swore to be her men. Then they passed judgment on Godrich, and sentenced him to be burnt to death. So Havelock and Goldborough came again into their kingdoms, and Havelock rewarded Grimm's sons and made them barons. Havelock was crowned king of England as well as of Denmark, and full sixty winters did he reign with Goldborough, in great joy and prosperity. End of section 31「Matt Benzing, Oxford, Ohio Junior Classics, Volume 4 Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry by William Patton Tales of Early English Chronicles Part 10 The Fair Unknown Retold by F. J. Darton Sir Gowan had a son and he was fair to look on, bright of face and well-favored in body. He was named Genlin, but for love of his fair face his mother called him Bofis, and no other name, and he never asked her what he was truly called, for Sir Gawain had wedded this lady secretly, and none knew that he was Genlin's father. On a certain day Genlin went to the woods to hunt the deer, and there he found a knight in gay armor, lying slain. Genlin wondered thereat, but in a little time he took off the knight's garments, and clad himself in the rich armor, and when he had done this, he went to Glastonbury, where King Arthur lay at the time. He came into the hall before the knights and greeted them. "'King Arthur, my lord,' he said, Grant that I may speak a word, I pray you. I would fain be made a knight. Tell me your name, answered King Arthur, for since I was born I never saw before me one so fair to look on. I know not what is my true name, answered the lad. While I was at home my mother, jesting, called me Bofis, and naught else. Then said Arthur the king, this is a wondrous thing, that the boy should know not his name when he would become a knight. Yet he is full fair of face. Now will I give him a name before you all. Let him be called Le Beau de Canesse, which is to say, the fair unknown. So is he to be named. Thereupon King Arthur made him a knight and gave him bright arms, and girt him with a sword, and hung round him a shield wrought with the design of a griffin. Sir Gawain took charge of him, to teach him knightly ways. When Le Beau Disconnes had been made a knight, he asked yet another boon of the king. My lord, he said, I should be right glad in my heart if I might have the first fight that is asked of you? I grant your asking, answered Arthur, the king, whatsoever the combat be. But you seem too young to do well in a great fight. Then they sat down to feast. Not long had they feasted ere there came a maiden riding, and a dwarf beside her, in a great heat as though with haste. The maid was called Elene, the bright and gentle. No countess or queen could be her equal in loveliness. She was richly clad, and the saddle and bridle of her milk-white steed were full of diamonds. Her dwarf wore silk of India. A stout and bold man was he, and his beard, yellow as wax, hanged down to his girdle. His shoes were decked with gold, and truly seemed a knight that felt no poverty. His name was Tiandelen. He was skilled in playing all musical instruments. The dwarf spoke to the maiden, and bade her tell her errand and lose no time. 
she knelt in the hall before all the knights and greeted them with honor and said never was sadder tidings than i bring my lady of cynodown is brought into a strong prison she prays king arthur to send her a knight of stout courage to win her out of prison up started the young knight le beau disconis his courage was stout and high arthur my lord he said i shall take up this combat and win the lady bright if you are true to your word certain it is that i have promised even so said king arthur god grant you grace and might then elaine began to complain and said alas that i was ever sent hither now will the word go forth that arthur's manhood is lost if you send a witless and wild child to deal doughty blows when there are knights of proved valor lancelot percivale and gawain le beau disconnes answered never yet was i afraid of any man i have learned to fight with spear and sword i will take the battle and never forsake it as is arthur's law then said arthur maiden you get no other knight of me if you think him not man enough go get another greater where you can the maid said no more but for wrath she would neither eat nor drink at their feast but sat down with her dwarf till the tables were taken away king arthur bade four of the best knights of the round table arm le beau disconis straight away in arms true and perfect through the help of christ he shall hold to his word and be a good champion to the lady of cynodown and uphold all her rights he said when he was armed le bodisconis sprang upon his horse and received the king's blessing and set forth a-riding with the maiden and the dwarf till the third day she railed at the young knight continually and on the third day when they came to a certain place she said Caitiff, now is your pride undone. This fail before us is kept by a knight who will fight every man that comes, and his fame is gone far abroad. William Celiberanche is his name, and he is a mighty warrior. Through heart or thigh of all those who come against him, he thrusts his spear. Does he fight so mightily, then? asked Le Beau Disconis. Has he never been hit? Whatsoever betides me, against him will I ride, and prove how he fights. On they rode, all three, till they came to a castle in the vale. There they saw a knight in bright armor. He bore a shield of green, with the device of three lions. And he was that William Salabranche, of whom Maid Elaine had spoken. When the knight had sighted them, he rode towards them, and said, Welcome, fair brother! He that rides here day or night must fight with me, or leave his arms here shamefully. Now let us pass, said Sir Le Beau Disconis. We have far to go to our friends, I and this maid. We must need speed on our way. You shall not escape so, answered William. Ere you go, we will fight. Then said Le Beau Disconis, now I see that it must be so. Make ready quickly, and do your best. Take courage with the spear, if you are a knight of skill, for I am in haste. No longer did they wait, but rode together in arms. Le Beau Disconnes smote William in the side with his spear, but William sat firm in his saddle. Nevertheless, so mightily was he struck that his stirrup leathers were broken, and he swayed over the horse's crupper and fell to the ground. His steed galloped away, but William started up speedily. By my faith never met I so stout a man, he said. Now that my steed is gone, let us fight on foot. They fell to on foot with falchions. So hard they struck that sparks flew from their helmets. But William drove his sword through Lobo Disconnas's shield, and a piece of it fell to the ground. And thereat Lobo Disconnas was wroth. 
He smote with his sword downwards from the crest of William's helmet even to his hauberk, and shaved off with the point of his blade the knight's beard, and well nigh cut the flesh also. Then William smote back so great a blow that his sword brake in two. "'Let me go alive!' cried William at that, seeing himself reft of his arms. It were great villainy to do to death an unarmed knight. I will spare you, said Le Beau Disconnes, if you swear a vow ere we go from one another. Kneel down, and swear on my sword to go to King Arthur, and say to him, Lord of renown, a knight sent me hither, defeated and a prisoner. His name is Le Beau de Canes, of unknown kilth and kin. William went upon his knees and took a vow as Lebo Disconnes bade him, and thus they departed each on his way. William took the road to Arthur's court, and it chanced that as he went, he met on that selfsame day three proud knights, his own sister's sons. "'William, our uncle,' said they, when they saw his wounds and his sorry array, "'who has done you this shame?' "'The man is not to blame.' answered William. He was a knight, stout and stern. One thing only grieves me sorely, that I must at his bidding go to King Arthur's court. And he told them of his vow. You shall be full well avenged, said they. He alone against us three is not worth a straw. Go your way, uncle, and fulfill your vow, and we will assail the traitor ere he be out of this forest. Then William went on his way to the court of King Arthur. But the three knights his nephews armed themselves, and leapt on their steeds, and without more tarrying went after Le Beau de Canes. Le Beau de Canes knew naught of this, but rode on with a fair maid, and made great mirth with her, for she had seen that he was a true and doughty knight. She asked pardon for the ill thing she had said against him at the king's court, and he forgave her this trespass and the dwarf was their squire, and served them in all their needs. At morning, when it was day, as they rode on towards Cynodown, they saw three knights in bright mail. They cried to him straight away, Thief, turn again and fight! I am ready to ride against you all, quoth Le Beau Discanes. He pricked his horse towards them. The eldest brother, Sir Gower was his name, ran against him with a spear, but Le Beau de Canes smote him such a blow that he broke his thigh, and ever after was lame. The knight groaned for pain, but Le Beau de Canes with might and main felled him altogether. The next brother came riding fierce as a lion, as if to cast Le Beau de Canes down. Like a warrior out of his wits, he smote Lebo de Canes on his helmet with his sword. He struck so hard that the blade drove through the helmet and touched the young knight's head. Then Lebo de Canes, when he felt the sword touch him, swung his sword as a madman, and all that he struck he clove through. Though two were against him, for the third brother also came riding to the fray, they saw that they had no might to withstand him in his fury. They yielded up their spears and shields to Lebo de Canes and cried, Mercy! Nay, answered Lebo de Canes, you escape not, unless you plight me your faith to go to King Arthur, and tell him that I overcame you and sent you to him. If you do not do so, I will slay you all three. The knights swore to go to King Arthur and plighted their troth upon it. Then they departed, and Le Bodicanes and the fair maid rode on towards Cynodown. All that day they rode, and at night they made their lodges in the wood out of green leaves and boughs, for they came nigh no town or castle, and thus for three days they pricked ever westwards. End of section 32Recording by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. Junior Classics, Volume 4, 
Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry by William Patton Tales from Early English Chronicles Part 11 The Fight with the Two Giants Retold by F. J. H. Darton As they slept at night, the dwarf woke, fearing that thieves might steal their horses. Suddenly his heart began to quake, for less than half a mile away he saw a great fire. "'Arise, young knight!' he cried. "'Arm yourself, and to horse. I doubt there is danger here. I hear a great sound, and smell burning afar off.' Le Beau de Conness leapt on his war-horse, and took his arms, and rode towards the fire. When he drew nigh, he saw that there were two giants, one red and loathly to look upon, and the other swarthy as pitch. The black giant held in his arms a maiden as bright as a flower, while the red giant was burning a wild boar on a spit before the flaming fire. The maiden cried aloud for help. Alas, said she, that I ever saw this day. Then said La Bodicanesse, It were a fair venture to save this maiden from shame. To fight with giants so grim is no child's game. He rode against them with his spear, and at the first course smote the black giant clean through the body, and overthrew him, so that never could he rise again. The maiden his prisoner fled from his grasp, and betook herself to Maid Elene and they went to the lodge of leaves in the wood, and prayed for victory for La Peau de Canesse. But the red giant, seeing his brother fall, smote at Le Beau de Canesse with the half-roasted boar like a madman, and he laid on so sore that Le Beau de Canesse's horse was slain. But Le Beau de Canesse leapt out of the saddle like a spark from a torch, and drove at him with his falchion, fierce as a lion. The giant fought with his spit till it broke in two. Then he caught up a tree by the roots and smote La Baudicanes so mightily that his shield was broken into three pieces. But before the giant could heave up the tree again, Le Baudicanes struck off his right arm, and at that sore wound he fell to the ground, and Le Baudicanes cut off his head. Then Le Beau de Canes turned to the two maidens, and he learned that she whom he saved was called Violette, and her father was Sir Atore, an earl in that country. Long had the two giants sought to take her, and the day before at eventide they had sprung out on her suddenly and carried her off. Le Beau de Canes took the giant's heads, and when he had escorted the maidens to the castle of Sir Atore, he sent the heads to King Arthur. Sir Atore wished to give him Violette to wife, but Le Beau de Canesse refused, saying that he was upon a quest with the fair Elaine, and with that they set forth once more on their journey. Presently they came to the fair city of Carvile, and saw there in a park a castle stout and stark, royally built. Never such a castle had they seen. Oh, said Lobo de Canesse, here were a worthy thing for a man to win. Then laughed Maid Elaine, the best knight in all the country round owns that castle, one gift round, she said. He that will fight with him, be it day or night, is bowed down and laid low. For love of his lady, who is wondrous fair, he is proclaimed that he will bestow a gerfalcon, white as a swan, on him who brings a fair lady. But if she be not so bright and fair as his lady, he must fight this knight Gifrown, who is a mighty warrior. Gifrown slays him and sets his head upon a spear, that it may be seen from afar abroad, and you may see on the castle walls a head or two set thus. 
I will fight this Gifron, said Labo de Canesse, and try for the Jerfalcon. I will say that I have seen in this town a lady fairer than his, and if he would see her, I will show him you. That were a great peril, said the dwarf. Sir Gifron beguiles many a knight in combat. Heed not that, answered Labo de Canesse. I will see his face ere I go westward from this city. Without more ado, they came to the town, and dwelt there in the inn for the night. In the morn, Le Bodicanes rose and armed himself, and rode with the dwarf towards Gifron's palace. Sir Gifron, when he came out of his house, saw Le Bodicanes advancing as proudly as a prince. He rode out to him and cried in a loud voice, Come you for good or for ill? I should have a great delight in fighting you, answered Le Bodicanes, for you say a grievous thing, that there is no woman so fair as your lady. I have in this town one fairer, and therefore I shall take your jerfalcon and give it to Arthur the king. Gentle knight, said Gifrown, how shall we prove which of the two be fairer? Here in Carvile City, said Labo de Canes, they shall both be set in the market-place, where all men may look on them. If my lady be not so esteemed fair as yours, I will fight with you to win the Jerfalcon. All this I grant, said Sir Gifron. This day shall it be done. And he held up his glove for a proof. Sir Labo de Canes rode to his lodging and bade Maid Elaine put on her seemliest robes. Then he sat her on a daffled palfrey, and they rode forth to the market-place. Presently came also Sir Gifron riding, with his lady and two squires. And the lady was so lovely that no man could describe her. All, young and old, judged that she was fairer than Elaine. She was as sweet as a rose in an arbor, and Elaine seemed but a laundry-maid beside her. Then said Sir Gifron, Sir Labodicanes, you have lost the Jerfalcon. Nay, said Labodicanes, we will joust for it. If you bear me down, take my head and the falcon, and if I bear you down, the falcon shall go with me. They rode to the lists, and many people with them, at the first course each smote the other on the shield, so that their lances were broken, and the sound of their onset was as thunder. Sir Gifron called for a lance that would not break. "'This young knight is as firm in his saddle as a stone in the castle wall,' quoth he. "'But were he as bold a warrior as Alexander or Arthur, Lancelot or Percival, I will shake him out over his horse's crupper.' Together they charged again. Labodicanus smote Gifron's shield from his arm at the shock. Never yet had man been seen to joust so stoutly. Gifron, like a madman, struck furiously back at him. But Labodicanus sat so firm that Gifron was thrown, horse and all, and broke his leg. All men said that Gifron had lost the white gerfalcon, and they bore him into town upon his shield. But Labodicanes sent the white gerfalcon to King Arthur for a gift, and the king sent him a hundred pounds weight of florins, and thereafter he feasted forty days in Carvile. At the end of this feasting, Labodicanes and the maid Elaine took their leave of Carvile and rode towards Cynodown. As they were riding, they heard horns blowing hard under a hill and the noise of hounds giving tongue in the vale. "'To tell truth,' said the dwarf Tiandelaine, "'I know that horn well. One Sir Otis de Lyo blows it. He served my lady some while, but in great peril fled into Wirral. As they rode talking, a little hound came running across their way, Never man saw hounds so gay. It was all the colors of flowers that bloom between May and Midsummer. Never have I seen such a jewel, said Maine Elaine, that so pleased me. 
Would I had him! La Bodicanes caught the hound, and gave him to her, and they went on their way. They had scarce ridden a mile before they saw a hind fleeing, and two greyhounds close upon it. They stopped and waited under a linden tree to watch, and they saw riding behind the hounds a knight clad in silk of India, upon a bay horse. He began to blow his bugle so that his men should know where he was. But when he saw La Bodicanes and the dog in Maid Elena's arms, he drew rein and said, Sir, that hound is mine. I have had him these seven years past. Friends, let him go. That shall never be, said La Bodicanes, for with my two hands I gave her to this maiden. Straight away answered Sir Otis de Lyle, for it was he, Then you are in peril. Churl, said La Bodicanes, I care not for whatever you say. Those are evil words, sir, said Sir Otis. Churl was never my name. My father was an earl and the Countess of Carvale my mother. Were I armed now, even as you are, we would fight. If you give me not the hound, you shall play a strange game ere evening. Whatsoever you do, answered La Bodicanes, this hound shall go with me. Then they took their way westward once more. But Sir Otis rode home to his castle and sent for his friends, and told them that one of Arthur's knights had used him shamefully and taken his little hound. They armed themselves, and when all was ready, rode out after La Bodicanes. Upon a high hill they saw him riding slowly. "'Traitor! You shall die for your trespass!' they cried to him when they came a little distance from him. Sir Bodicanes beheld how full of knights the vale was. "'Maid Elaine,' he said, "'we are come into a sorry case for the sake of this little hound. It were best that you should go into the greenshaws and hide your heads. For though I be slain, yet will I abide combat with these knights.' Into the woods they rode, but Le Bodicanes stayed without, as beseems an adventurous knight. They shot at him with bows and arbalists, but he charged with his horse, and bore down horse and man and spared none. Whosoever La Bodicanes struck after the first blow, that man slept for evermore. But soon La Bodicanes was beset, as in a net. Twelve knights came riding through the forest in arms clear and bright. All day they had rested, and thought thereby to slay La Bodicanes. One of them was Sir Otis himself, and they smote at La Bodicanes all at once, and thought to fell him. Fierce was the fight. Sword rang on steel, sparks sprang from shield and helmet. La Bodicanes slew three, and four flew. But Sir Otis and his four sons stayed to sell their lives there. La Bodicanes against those five fought like a madman. His sword brake, and he took a great blow on his helmet that bore him down. Then the foeman thought to slay him outright, but La Bodicanes was minded suddenly of his axe that was at his hinder saddle-bow. He quitted himself like a true knight. Three steeds he hewed down in three strokes. Sir Otis saw that sight, and turned his horse and fled. La Bodicanes stood no longer on defense, but pursued him, and caught him under a chestnut tree, and made him yield. La Bodicanes sent this knight also to King Arthur for a sign of his powers, and himself, and made Elaine, went to Sir Otis's castle, and there rested and were refreshed. End of section 33 Ohio Junior Classics, Volume 4 Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry by William Patton In the Castle of the Sorcerers Retold by F. J. H. Darton when they had tarried at the castle a certain time, they rode forth again. It was the month of June, when the days are long and the birds' songs are merry. 
Sir Labo de Canes and the maid Elaine and the dwarf Tiandelaine came riding by a riverside and saw a great and proud city with high strong castles and many gates. Labo de Canes asked the name of the city. They call it Golden Isle, answered maid Elaine. Here hath been more fighting than in any country, for a lady of price, fair as a rose, has put this land in peril. A giant named Margi, whose like is nowhere on earth, has laid siege to her. He is as black as pitch, stern and stout indeed. He that would pass the bridge into her castle must lay down his arms, and do a reverence to the giant. Then said Labo de Canes, I shall not turn aside for him. If God give me grace, ere this day's end, I will overthrow him. They rode all three towards the fair city. On a wooden bridge they saw Magi, as bold as a wild boar. His shield was black, and all his armor black also. When he saw La Bodicanes, he cried, Tell me, fellow in white, what are you? Turn home again for your own profit. Arthur made me a knight, said La Bodicanes, and to him I made a vow that I would never turn back. Therefore, friend in black, make ready. They rode forthright at one another. Their lances break at the first blows. But they drew swords in a fury and rushed at one another. La Bodicanes smote the giant's shield so that it fell from him. But Magi, in turn, slew La Bodicanes's steed with a great blow on its head. La Bodicanes said naught, but started up from his dead charger and took his axe. A great blow he struck, that shore the head of Magi's horse clean from its body. Then they fell to on foot, and no man can tell of the blows that passed from one to the other, and they fought till evening drew nigh. Sir Labo de Canes thirsted sore, and he said, Magi, let me go to drink. I will grant you what boon you ask of me in like case. Great shame would it be to slay a knight by thirst. Magi granted it, but when Labo de Canes went to the river and drank, Magi struck him unawares, such a blow that he fell into the river. Now am I truly refreshed cried Labo de Canes as he climbed out. I will repay you for this. Then a new fight was begun, and they continued till darkness grew apace. At length Labo de Canes struck such a blow that the giant's right arm was shorn off. Thereupon Magi fled, but Labo de Canes ran swiftly after him, and with three stern strokes clove his backbone. Then Labo de Canes smote off the giant's head and went into the town, and all the folk welcomed him. A fair lady came down to meet him, called La Dame d'Amour, and she thanked him for his aid against the giant, and led him to her palace. There he was clad in clean raiment, and feasted, and the lady would have had him be lord of her city and castle. La Beaudicanes granted her prayer, and gave her his love, for she was indeed fair and bright. Alas, that he did not refrain. Twelve months and more he dwelt there, and fair Elaine was afraid, lest he might never go thence. For the lady of the castle knew much of sorcery, and put a charm on Le Beau de Canes, so that he wished never to leave her. But it fell on a day that Le Beau de Canes met maid Elaine by chance within the castle. Sir Knight, she said, you are false of faith to King Arthur. For love of a sorceress you do great dishonor. The lady of Cynodown lies in prison yet. At her words, Le Bodicanes thought his heart would break for sorrow and shame. By a postern gate he crept away from the lady of the castle, and took with him his horse and his armor, and rode forth with maid Elaine and the dwarf, and a squire named Giflet. Fast they rode without ceasing, till on the third day they came in sight of the strong city of Cynodown. But La Bodicanes wondered at a custom he saw as he described the town, for all the waste and refuse. 
that was cast outside the town was gathered again by the folk and kept. What means this? asked Sir Le Beau Deaconess. This it is, said Maid Elaine. No knight may abide here without leave of a steward called Sir Lambard. Ride to that eastern gate yonder and ask his leave to enter fairly and well. Ere he grants it, he will joust with you. And if he bears you down, he will blow his trumpets, and all through Cynodown at the sound thereof, the maidens and boys will throw on you this filth and mud that they have gathered. And so to your life's end will you be known as a coward, and King Arthur shall lose his honor through you. That were great shame for any man living, said Sir Lebeau Deaconess. I will meet this man. Giflet, make me ready. Then they made ready and rode to the castle gate, and asked where knights might find lodging. The porter let them in and asked, Who is your overlord? King Arthur, the well of courtesy and flower of chivalry is my lord, answered Le Beau de Canes. The porter went and told Sir Lambard of the knight, and Sir Lambard was glad and vowed to joust with him. Thereupon the porter came again to La Beau de Canes and said, Adventurous knight, Ride to the field without the castle gate, and arm you speedily, for my lord would joust with you. Sir Le Beau de Canes rode to the field and made ready. Presently there came the steward, all armed for the fight, and they fell too. Long and fierce was the fray, but at the last Le Beau de Canes struck Sir Lambard so fiercely that he was borne clean out of his saddle backwards. Will you have more? asked Sir Lebo de Canes. Nay, answered Sir Lambard, never since I was born came I against such a knight. If you will fight for my lady, you are welcome, Sir Knight. Nay, said Sir Lebo de Canes, but I fight for a lady even now. Then they went into Sir Lambard's castle and feasted and were right merry. Sir Lambard and Sir Lebo de Canes spoke much of adventures. And at last Sir Le Beau de Canes asked him concerning his quest, What is the knight's name who holds in prison the gentle lady of Cynodown? Nay, sir, knight is he none. Two magicians are her foes, false in flesh and bone. Mabon and Irene are their names, and they have made this town a place of strange magic arts. They hold this noble lady in prison, and often we hear her cry, but have no power to come to her. They have sworn to slay her if she will not do their will, and give up to them all her rights in this fair dukedom which is hers. They took their rest. On the morrow Le Beau de Canes clad himself in his best armor, and rode forth to the gate of the great palace of Cynodown, and with him for escort came Lambard and his knights. They found the gate open. But no further durst any man go save Le Beau de Canes and his squire Giflet, and Le Beau de Canes made Giflet also turn back with the rest. Then he rode alone into the palace, and alighted at the great hall. He saw minstrels before the dais, and a fire burning brightly, but no lord of the palace was there. Le Beau de Canes paced through all the chambers, and saw no one but minstrels who made merry. Le Beau de Canes went further seeking those whom he should fight. He peered into all the corners, and looked on wondrous pillars of jasper and fine crystal, but never a foe did he see. At last he sat down at the dais in the great hall. As he sat, the minstrels ceased their music and vanished, and the torches were extinguished. Doors and windows shook like thunder, and the very stones of the walls fell round him. The dais began to quake, and the roof above opened. As he sat thus dismayed, believing that he was betrayed by magic, he heard horses neigh. Yet may I hope to joust, he said, better pleased. He looked out into a field, and there he saw two knights come riding with spear and shield. Their armor was of rich purple, with golden garlands. One of the knights rode into the hall. Sir knight, he cried, proud though you be, you must fight with us. I am ready to fight, answered Le Beau de Canes, and he leapt into his saddle and rode against the knight. 
his might bore against Nabon, for it was he, over his horse's tail, the hinder saddle-bow broke and he fell. With that rode in a rein, fully armed, fresh for the fight, and meaning with main and might to assail Sir Labo de Canesse. But Labo de Canesse was aware of him, and bore down on him with his spear, leaving Mabon where he had fallen. They broke their lances at the first stroke and fell to swords. As they fought, Mabon rose up from the ground and ran to aid Irain. But Labo de Canesse fought both, and kept himself back warily. When Irain saw Mabon, he smote fiercely at Labo de Canesse and struck his steed. But Sir Lobo de Canesse returned his blow, and shore off his thigh, skin and bone and all. Of no avail were his arms or his enchantments then. Then Lobo de Canesse turned swiftly again to Mabon, and Mabon with a great blow broke the knight's sword. But Lobo de Canesse ran to Irain, where he lay dying, and drew from him his sword, and rushed fiercely upon Mabon once more and smote off his left arm with the shield. "'Ho, gentle knight,' said Mabon, "'and I will yield that to your will, and will take you to the fair lady. Though the wound from that sword I am undone, for I pose in both it and mine to make certain of slaying you.' "'I will have none of your gifts were I to win all the world by them,' said Labo de Canesse. "'Lay on. One of us shall die.' Then they fell to again, and so fiercely did Lebeau de Canesse fight, that in a little while he cleft Mabon's head and helmet in twain. When Mabon was slain, he ran to where he had left Irain, meaning to cleave his head also. But Irain was not there. He had been borne away. Whither, Lebeau de Canesse did not know. He sought him everywhere, and when he found him not, he believed that he was caught in a snare, and fell on his knees and prayed. As he prayed, a marvel came to pass. In the stone wall a window opened, and a great dragon issued therefrom. It had the face of a woman, fair and young, her body and wings shone like gold. Her tail was loathly, and her paws grim and great. Labo de Canessa's heart sank within him, and he trembled. Ere he could think, the dragon clasped him by the neck and kissed him. And lo, as he kissed him, the tail and wings fell from it and he saw before him the fairest lady he had ever looked upon. "'Gentle knight,' she said, "'you have slain the two magicians, my foes. They changed me into a dragon, and bade me keep that shape till I had kissed Sir Gawain, or some other knight of kin to Sir Gawain. You have saved my life. I will give you fifteen castles and myself for wife, if it be King Arthur's will.' Then was Lebeau de Canesse glad and blithe, and leapt on his horse and rode back to Sir Lambard to bring him these good tidings. And presently there came to him from the palace the lady herself, richly clad, and all the people of the town made a fair procession in her train. Every knight in Cynodown did her homage and fealty as was due to her. Seven nights did they abide in the castle with Lambard, and then Sir Lebeau de Canesse returned with the fair lady to King Arthur and at his court gave thanks to God for their adventures. King Arthur gave the lady to La Beau de Canesse for wife, and the joy of that bridal can be told in no tale or song. End of Part 34